Welcome back to Creepy Confidential. I'm your host, Noelle, your resident weirdo Wisconsinite. Here on Creepy Confidential, I open case files on my favorite cryptids, cults, conspiracies, and other worldly creepy. What's up, creeps? Welcome back. This episode, we're going to be diving into the world of maniacal medicine. We're going to be talking about the starvation doctor, also known as Linda Hazard. Now, this doctor, air quotes, big air quotes, killed at least 15 people using her extreme fasting treatments until patients were so delirious from hunger and malfunction of their body, they would sign over their estate and hand over their valuables. Patients were fasted for weeks and sometimes months on a diet of her special tomato broth, asparagus juice, and occasional orange juice. Now, this tomato broth is literally just tomatoes and water. It's not like a tomato soup, a delicious tomato soup with all the goodies. It's literally just the broth that's left over, the water. Now, in in conjunction with the diet, she would do these treatments that included enemas. Now, these enemas, because we're cleaning out everything, right? She's getting everything out sometimes at first lasted for hours and some enemas lasted for the day, the whole day, which is insane to me, (laughs) just knowing what happens. Now, in conjunction with that, she would also do these massage treatments. Now, this is not like, yay, I'm at the spa and they have those little cool little bells that make noise or ocean sounds. No, she's literally pummeling her patients over the back, her head, that front of their head, their forehead, you know, and essentially trying to expel the the bad nastiness, the sickness from their bodies. And this went on over quite some years. So let's talk about her. Let's talk about her. So Linda Hazard, now initially her last name was Burfield and, and she did spell her name differently. So she obviously, you know, was trying to run from something. So Linda was born uh, December 18th of 1867. Now, oh, that makes her, she's a Sagittarius. Now, I thought Sagittarius's were supposed to be like mellow and non, you know, invasive and things like that. But they are go-getters, you know, if you're into that sort of thing. So anyway, um, and she was born in Carver, Minnesota. We don't claim her as a Midwesterner, by the way. I just want to put that out there in the water because she's, you know, insane. Now, she made her way out to Washington uh, after leaving her two children um, after her first alleged victim. Now, I say alleged because, again, she managed to rack up the bodies and run from the whole time. But that's what she did. Now, she essentially started her degree. I'll say degree. I keep having to come back to that because she's not actually a doctor. She started her interest in alternative medicine, and that is potentially what what took out her first victim. So once she made it out to Washington, um, she found that Washington had a loophole for people practicing alternative medicine, which, voila, she's a doctor now. She's studied, uh, apparently studied under the Edward... Dewey. Now I say the Edward Dewey because he's actually quite famous for his fasting techniques, kind of the no breakfast guy, if you will. I I believe that's what he was. He was kind of into the no breakfast thing, Um, which, you know, we've kind of proved it's not it's not very good for you to, to just, you know, you have to have a little something to get the day going. So I'm no doctor, no scientist. I'm just saying this is what I've read. So thus, once she's obtained, I'm a doctor. Her plan begins. Now, she kicked off her everything. In my mind, I see this as a way to kick it off by writing a book called Fasting for the Cure of Disease. And people were looking for the latest fad to cure them of what ails them. Because think about it. Back in the day, this was the early 1900s. Sure, we were making strides in medicine. But, I mean, if you had something, even the flu could still kill you. 
it's, it's, an, it's insane. So people really jumped on board uh, back then for alternative medicine. You know, it really wasn't in the world of snake oil still, but it kind of was where you could, you could sell anything to somebody who was sick and just wanted to be better and not die. But also you have those people who just want to jump on the latest fad, even like today, you know, you hear about, we'll come back to the keto diet, although that isn't necessarily a fad, but people use it as a fad now because so-and-so lost 50 pounds. Well, it's only supposed to be used for this type of thing, but now everybody sees it as it's working. So they're going to jump on the train. Now everybody wants to do it, even if they're not following the rules correctly. So once she realized she had this book out, that's kind of what set, set it out in there to the, and to the world so that people knew who she was. You know, people bought books so, so that they could, uh, it wasn't like today where you just, you know, you pick up the phone and you can scroll through everything. Like people wanted to read in their pastime or learn about something new or, or that was how you got the word out. So people would talk about it. And now the, the people were starting to want to know about her treatments. Now she established her sanitarium and back then she called it wilderness heights. That sounds so nice, right? Um, yeah, it's not, not nice, but uh, at Wilderness Heights, and she that was out in Olala, Washington. Now, another little full disclosure moment, as I've done in the past about like what, where I work, the type of job I do. I lived in Washington State for uh, about 15, eh, maybe not that long, like 12, 13 years, something like that. And I lived near Starvation Heights. Uh, that's what that's called now, of course, is the new name, Starvation Heights. And so her private residence, her little, her home exists. And um, I was part of a paranormal team and I actually got to go to this house. So I have, I do have some knowledge about location, what it looks like. I've been in there. We'll talk about that later. But it's, it's crazy because Olala, while it's near everything, it's not. When you're out there, I mean, you feel, you feel like you are like in another, like hours and hours and hours away from any, anywhere when really you're right by the water, you're near ish to some of the big places, but you can really get lost out there. And that's exactly, you know, essentially what she, I think she wanted to do now on the property, uh, wilderness Heights is there's a ravine. It's right there. It's out in the middle of nowhere. Um, in Olala and it's, it really is pretty out there though. I'll give it that. Imagine kind of the mossy trees. It's not like here, uh, in the Midwest where, you know, everything does, it goes through full seasons. It's beautiful. It's bright. It's green. It's lush. And then it's dry. We go through our fall season there. It's always kind of, kind of mossy and, and wet. And it's, it's a totally different environment. But I totally went off on a tangent. So let's get back on this. I wanted to build you what Wilderness Heights probably was plucked, you know, and put into. So now when a patient would die that was under her care at Wilderness Heights, she conveniently could do the autopsy because, remember, she's a doctor now. So it was always the disease that essentially caught up to the individual. If you went there... Uh, to be cured and you died, it wasn't the fasting that did it. It was the cancer or the, you know, g gut problems, whatever. It was always the disease and not that. Another thing that she would say is either cancer, undiagnosed illness, or it seemed like she blamed a lot of them on a liver issue, cirrhosis of the liver, or liver issue. Now, Another piece of information is, it's kind of a strange thing to know. So if you say you have a very large cat, we'll say a cat, and they're very large and all of a sudden they stop eating for some reason, right? They're sick, they have a blockage, whatever, and they stop eating. If you don't get that big baby to start eating, you are going to get, they're going to have a condition called fatty liver and that's, and it just shuts down. It's, it's, they get sick and they can die from that. So I often wonder that when she talks about the liver problems, if that's essentially what she was causing, because you can have a non-alcoholic, because alcoholics can get you know, liver problems too, uh, a non-alcoholic induced fatty liver. So 
these are things that I think about, you know, in the wee hours. <laughs> if I had a fat cat and this was an individual and they lost all this weight and weren't eating, could that be what it was? But to her, that's just what she noted. So patients were starved to the point of just delirium that they would sign letters that turned out to be a power of attorney, uh, you know, essentially just signing over um, everything, including themselves or wills or deeds. And then the wills often requested cremation, which is convenient because the property also had a crematory on it. Now, that little piece of cement blocks actually still exists. It's in the middle of the woods. I got to see it. I got to touch it. I got to look at it. And it's, it's incredible to know that she thought of everything. She truly thought of everything. So that, you know, oh, well, poor Edward wanted to be cremated. Well, we'll just take care of that for you. You don't have to come out here. Boop, gone. And you never get to see what the body truly looks like. So that just incredible that that's she managed to do all of that. Now, also convenient to the property is just behind her residence. There's a huge ravine. I'm talking, you know, I, I'm not very good at distances, but if you fell down one, you'd be dead. Conveniently behind the property is a huge ravine. I'm talking like you could hide things down this ravine and it's a, a rumor on the rumor mill is that she also was known to um, dispose of individual uh, down into the ravine so she really had quite the setup out there which is incredible now let's talk about her house for a minute now of the wilderness heights the actual wilderness heights uh, that that building is gone. It burned down. Uh, and we'll we'll talk about that a little bit at the end of the uh, end of talking about her. Um, that building's gone. But her her house, um, I got to go into. Now we were given verbal permission. We went in there. We walked around. I don't have pictures. I don't have video. Um, I did, but they have they have been destroyed. So you just have to take my word for it and just, just walk along with me here. Now you can look at pictures and on the internet, I'm sure people have posted, um, either they broke in illegally because you could easily get into this house or they managed uh, to also get permission. So now the, her little house, uh, was not as big as her big sanitarium. Uh, when you walk in, it's a, you know, there's a cozy living room to the right, a little fireplace, right? A couple little little bedrooms and a kitchen in the back. And then there's, uh, to the left, it went to, it used to be an open air porch when you look at old pictures, but it does appear uh, through time that it is, they turned it into like a closed up porch with windows. So you could go there and look at the rocking chairs. It is kind of creepy looking at old pictures, knowing that you were standing in that exact spot. Uh, the piano was was still there. It was in the front hallway. Um, it you yes, of course we had to play a note, which was really creepy, but we did it. And then we went upstairs. Now upstairs was apparently her room. And what's interesting is these are not ordinary steps. These were like hideaways. Like one of them I remember specifically uh, was a hideaway step, so that she could hide jewelry, whatever she was trying to keep hidden underneath this step. And then another interesting place was behind the fireplace. Now, apparently they didn't know that this little hideaway spot was here because um, the people that owned it, they're not relatives of Miss Hazard. I think they just bought the property, um, you know, and they were, they couldn't, couldn't restore it. It was just too far gone. So I'm looking around the fireplace and I'm very curious by nature and it's, I'm in the fireplace. There's obviously no fire. And I noticed behind the fireplace where it looks like a clock would have went on the front. Maybe there wasn't anything there. There was a little metal like latch door that you could open and you could put things inside. So another little creepy spot because if the fire was burning, no one was going to be looking in there. So they probably could put things in there as well. So it was so, it was so weird and interesting to be in this house. And then the claw foot tub. Now, as a paranormal investigator, uh, now it's not on my everyday resume these days, but I do still dabble. I, I am not the touchy feely kind of paranormal investigator. I'm the, give me a fact and then let's talk about it. However, comma, this bathroom 
was creepy. It was so creepy. It had the clawfoot tub where she performed her autopsies um, or would often put the canvas draping, draping over the top where she was doing her enema treatments. Um, and it had like the, you know, around those clawfoot tubs, they'll have like a, a metal rod that curves where they can close the shower curtain over the top. And behind it, there's these cabinets, old school cabinets. And you open them and there are little handwritten numbers on the inside. Now, I never could figure out exactly what we were, what, what was Linda writing in here? Because this had, had not been touched. This was still hanging out. This was, you know, an 80-year-old house. And there's little numbers. I don't know if she was counting tablets. I don't know if she was counting who knows what. You know, money. It was pretty incredible. Pretty incredible. So that house was very, very cool. Now, the basement, the basement's also very creepy. Now, when we went down into the basement, it had, it wasn't your normal basement where it's like concrete walls and things like that. This was kind of a dirt floored basement. And then around the outside were these warbled shapes of concrete, like blobs. I can't think of a better, a better word to describe it other than blobs. And I asked, you know, the homeowners, uh, like, have you guys ever investigated to see why these blobs of concrete look this way? And and they go, no, we just blah, 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 blah. I'm like, y'all are afraid there's bodies in there. <laughs> I didn't say that, but that's what I was thinking. <laughs> so it's it's creepy. Apparently, there's also a room in the basement. There were It was not there. You could only see the outline where walls might have been. And it... They described it to me that it was a room where it had one door, no window, and it was just a little slidey hole that on the front of the door, and they said that that was torn down. Now, if that was to check, you know, put her patients in there, wait until they die, I'm not sure. A special closet, it's total speculation. But I would say the basement and the clawfoot tub were by far uh, the, the creepiest parts of that whole house now it's, just thinking about it <laughs> the crematory was now you're you're thinking like you're thinking crematory it's not like a building it was literally imagine a little stone furnace that's out in the middle of nowhere and you could uh just see a little part of where the concrete wall bases were but you know it was gone it burned down so all the other stuff was gone now let's talk about who this lady killed now, if you're going to move out to the middle of Olala and just start knocking off people that, that don't have friends in high places, it's going to take a little while, at least back then, to get busted. But this lady, oh no, she wanted people that were rich. I'm talking gajillionaires in our day, you know, that had everything. They had land, they had houses, they had deeds, they had jewels, they had money. So those are the ones that she was going after. And it seems like those are the ones who were coming because they wanted, they wanted to be treated, you know, special and have to go to the wilderness heights. And that's not how, obviously how it went down. So let's talk about some big names. Um, now the, the biggest one is when you look up starvation heights, the, the first two names that always pop up are the sisters. And we'll talk about those in a minute. But the, the one that I always kind of come back to, now if you live in the Washington area, you are familiar with Ivers Chowder. It's delicious. They, I've gone, when we've been out on investigations out like in Bothell, we stopped the one there, there's one at the ferry. Ivers Chowder, Chowder is huge. It turns out, oh, you guys guessed it, in 1908, Miss Daisy... Maud, um, she is Ivor Haglund's mom. Poor Ivor. So Daisy went out there for treatment and died under the care of Linda Hazard. And apparently, what do you know, Linda Hazard uh, did the autopsy and she died of stomach cancer. So she never went to, you know, never had justice for that. Um, and Ivor went on to start a food chain. <laughs> Which is kind of ironic, <laughs> but maybe I'm getting the wrong definition of that. But good for you. Good for you for going and starting a food chain, even though your mom was starved to death. Oh, my God. Craziness. So, if by the way, if you're ever on Washington, have Ivers chowder. It's delicious. Now, moving on, the sisters. Let's talk about the sisters. 
Not the other people, not that the other people that she killed was not important, but these sisters are the ones that always come up because they're the reason why she got busted. So these two sisters, Claire and Dorothea Williamson, they are were young. They're very young ladies. They wanted, but they were close in age. They wanted to be treated by Dr. Linda Hazard. I believe one of them said uh, she had intestinal problems, and then the other one said that they had, she had a dropped uterus. Now, I don't know why you would even slightly entertain the idea that you need uh, fasting for a dropped uterus, but I am not a doctor. <laughs> That's just my two cents on that one. So anyway, these two sisters uh, essentially went under the care of, of Ms. Hazard. Now, when they started their care, they actually were at, it sounds like a like an apartment, a fancy apartment that was set up for these two. These two ladies were were rich. They came from a rich family. They literally just traveled. They didn't have to work their family. You know, they just traveled around. Um, and now they started at their treatment at an apartment because the, the sanitarium was, they were told the sanitarium was not ready for them yet. It was not completed yet. And what's crazy is, is it started, you know, they started starving them and, and it was thinner and thinner and people were, were seeing them. And then they had to transfer them and they brought a special ambulance to transfer these poor gals. And it said that, you know, they watched these basically skeletons with skin draped over them, but blankets over them to get them into the ambulance to take them off to Olala. And once they were out in Olala, Linda just kicked it into overdrive and it was a matter of just trying, you know, trying to get them to the end, essentially. And as they started to get more delirious, um, they they did, they signed things that they weren't supposed to sign, you know, uh, like they said, the power of attorney, and uh, they signed over their deeds. It was, it was insane that this was happening. But it, it was a matter of Dorothea finally saw Claire, right? And she, she was, I think it, she had an aha moment, perhaps, and was like, you're gonna die, you know, you're really bad. You, this can't happen. And she got a hold of her governess, which was in Australia via telegram. Now, back then, you couldn't just, you know, hop a flight, and get here in a couple hours. This is a transatlantic trip to get here. So unfortunately, by the time the governess had made it here, Claire had passed. Now, there was time between when she passed and when the governess actually saw the body. And, you know, they showed her an embalmed body, but it said that this, this body did not look like Claire, um, that the skin, you know, the, the color was different. The hair was different. And it's just, you know, maybe they were just given more information about, well, that's what the embalming does, or it's been a while or something like that. But for someone, again, who works in the funeral business, I, are around the funeral business, I'm, I see bodies that, that that maybe, maybe they have to come back out of the, you know, being disinterred. I think that's the word. Uh, And it's been a while. And it's amazing that they actually, they still look pretty good. And I'm talking decades have gone by where this was not decades have gone by. So, I often wonder if she managed to swap out the body and just was like, she's so sick. This is what she looks like. So they managed to, uh, they wanted to take Dorothea, but at that time, essentially Linda could hold up a piece of paper and say, sorry, Dorothea signed over her power of attorney to me and I'm in charge of her health. So they have, I had to phone in another family member who was in uh, a high paying job of some kind. I believe I believe was a lawyer. Don't quote me on that. Of course, now I'm going off off my brain on, on information. But they had to work things back and forward and it became, okay, you know, I think they tried to prove that she had forged these things. And then she was like, well, you, you, can, you can take her, but it's going to be this amount of dollars. And it's like they had to take, they had to pay to take her away. It's, it's crazy. You, if you read the story, um, there's a really good book called Starvation Heights by Greg Olson. Um, a lot of this information, it's been a while. Um, you know, I've kind of re, re-upped a little bit, but it's a, it's a long book about the whole story about Starvation Heights. And there's a much longer detailed information about, about that. I, I don't know that gentleman at all, but I just I have the book. It's really good. Now, so this whole thing starts and they're like, 
oh, we're going to we're going to take this. They're going to take this woman down because, again, Dorothea's got money and it's time to go. And they're mad. So Kitsap County, good old Kitsap County, ugh, <laughs> Kitsap County. I lived in Kitsap County. Kitsap County would not pay for the trial for uh, for this, for bringing Claire, you know, the fact that Claire had passed, you know, that murdered, essentially, they wouldn't pay for this trial. So you know what Dorothea did? She paid for the trial herself. And in 1912, uh, she, Linda Hazard was convicted of manslaughter for Claire's death. Now, the trial uh, proved that Hazard forged Williamson's will. So it's just crazy, though, that you did this, there's all this behind you, and you still only get manslaughter? I don't understand that. So Hazard was sentenced to 2 to 20 years in the Washington State Penitentiary in Walla Walla. However, she was released on parole on December 26, 1915, after only two years. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Two years. Uh, and uh, a year after that, the governor, Ernest Lister, uh, gave her a full pardon for the crimes. Isn't that insane? It's all who you know, man. It's all who you know. Now, Hazard died in 1938 uh, while attempting a fasting cure on herself at uh, the age of 70. Now, it's just insane. Uh, you know, I've stood in her bedroom. I've walked on her hideaway steps. And only now uh, does that home rest. It's insane. It's it's finally, it's been destroyed with time, and I believe it's uh, recently been bulldozed. Now, for those of you who might be traveling uh, to the Washington area, a uh, fun thing to look at is her clawfoot tub. I have not been, been back since this is open, because this is fairly recently. Her clawfoot tub, the Washington State Patrol mug shots of her and her husband, and a portion of those very steps can be viewed at a Gig Harbor Museum uh, inside the Olala Bay Landing. So whoever wants to check it out, you guys can go take a look. Now, you can't walk through the house or anything like that, obviously, anymore, but it's, it's kind of wild. It's wild that those things still exist. So thank you guys for joining me here on my journey today. I'm hanging out in my lounge today, so uh, if you're hearing a little more noise than usual, it's because I'm just hanging out. Uh, I just want to talk about Dr. Hazard today. Please feel free, please follow us on, we are on YouTube, we are on Instagram, we are on Facebook. You will be able to listen to this podcast on Spotify, Anchor, and as always, I will put up a YouTube link with visuals this time. I have uh, finally, hopefully, mastered that. Visuals where you can see uh, Dr. Hazard, her Wilderness Heights. Hopefully, I can find uh, some more pictures for you so you can actually see her home and what it looks like out there. So give us a follow. Got some new things coming up here in the future, but as always... Thanks, creeps. See you next time.